another welcome to another episode of El Último Segundo. Uh, hoy vamos a estar hablando de un poco de los animales, un poco de este de un poco de la vida, de la transición de de one of our good friends, de Dr. Gwen. Entonces, eh, primero deja voy a saludar a a Saúl. Saúl, ¿cómo estás? Bien, Luis, gracias. Uh, bien, por lo mucho. Can't complain. Ready for this interview. No, uh, no más Greg por el frío, ¿no? <laughs> yeah, no más por el frío, que está, se siente menos ocho aquí, pero not too bad. Bueno, y comentar también que Gwen is our first uh, woman on the podcast, which is a very, a very good thing, because I know I, I was looking for a, a woman guest for quite a while, so that means a lot. Gwen, how are you? Good, how are you guys? Hi, everybody. Hello, hello. Um, how how you been? I know we haven't talked in like, since I was wedding, I think. Yeah, yeah. It's been a long time. I've been good, working as always. Always busy with work. Yeah. Nothing's really changed. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Saul, I think, is also a slave at work, too. Uh, as usual. Um <laughs> I, I honestly, before this, was still working. So, <laughs> work from yeah, home. Yeah, I know. Work from home. Um, pues, ¿dónde empezamos, no? Uh, how did you get started in, uh, in your career? Um, I mean, I always wanted to be a vet since I was little. I think that's kind of the main story of a lot of people that become veterinarians. Uh, I just kind of continued on. My mom thought I was going to change my mind, and I didn't because I'm stubborn. Um, but uh, I volunteered a lot at different shelters during high school. And then uh, I did volunteer technical work. So I was a veterinary technician for quite some time while I was in college and throughout grad school and then veterinary school, obviously, so I could gain more experience. But I don't know. been wanting to do it since forever, so kind of stuck with it. And uh, how was the process? All of, all of it from uh, from when you started to school and everything. Was it hard? Were you going to give up at one point? Or what kept you going exactly? Yes, most definitely was going to give up at one point. So um, for a lot of people, people don't think that veterinarians are real doctors. It is a common thing amongst our profession, but we are. I get my doctorate of veterinary medicine, which is why I'm Dr. Gwen Vasquez. Um, we go through the same type of ordeal as human medical people. So I did um, three years of undergraduate. Um, I did a master's degree because I graduated early and I didn't apply to veterinary school in time for that first session. You have to apply a year in advance. Um, so I had a gap year. So I filled that with getting another degree because I didn't have a job to pay back loans. So I started off my master's and then while I was in graduate school, I applied to about six different veterinary schools. Um, you do have to pay for those applications. So in total, I think I spent about $1,500 just on applications alone. And then it's basically a, a pooling process. So you have to have a certain GPA. You also have to have a certain amount of hours related to veterinary field, whether you're in lab medicine, uh, a technician, basically anything animal related. And then based off of that pool, then you get picked to go interview. Um, and so I got to interview at three different schools, um, Midwestern University here in Arizona, where I graduated from. Um, Western University in California and uh, Virginia Tech. Um, and then once you go through your interview process, then it is a waiting process and they have what's known as a wait list. So I was waitlisted, which means you weren't good enough at the moment to get that first seat available. So they said, you know, maybe there was something missing. They send out um, acceptance letters to over amount of people over the class size and the algorithm of X amount of people are going to say no. And then you go down the wait list and offer those people that seat that wasn't taken. So I was on the very top of the wait list. So a lot of people that did not respond is the reason I got into vet school. If not, I would have had to wait and apply again. Um, but it is basically four years of undergraduate school, or in my case, I did grad and undergrad, and then it is four years of medical school. 
a lot of people don't think that it is that difficult, but for most of us, our backup was human medicine because it's a lot easier to become a human doctor than it is to become a veterinarian. Um, the GPA is higher for veterinary school. There's only 33 veterinary schools in the entire United States and a normal class size is about 100, 125. So it's a very large to small pooling process to become a veterinarian. That just lets you know like how competitive that field is. It's crazy. Um, and like you can see it that vet like there's not many vets or some people like because of like those constraints that you're saying how like the pool is so small you end up seeing people quit and they end up turning to that right so that pool size starts dropping as soon as possible yeah it also drops throughout veterinary school too um mainly because of the curriculum so i'm not gonna lie second year is what's known as the dropout year of veterinary school because it's the hardest year of the entire school year you have the hardest classes um, you have the hardest time getting through those classes. Um, and then it is usually that year that you're also starting to get introduced to how you should be thinking critically from a practical side of things. So how you apply everything you're learning to actual clinical medicine. So a lot of people that get into veterinary school, it's if you don't make it past your second year, you don't make it past your second year and you have to start over again. So like we may start with a class of 140 and by the time we get to graduation, we have 120, 125. I'm not gonna lie to you. I honestly wanted to quit my second year because it was extremely, extremely difficult. Um, one of my classes, I honestly thought I was gonna fail, um, which was difficult, but I think it was just more, I was not, uh, I was not being true to my own studying skills. I was thinking that I needed to try a different way to do something to pass that teacher's tests. And I tried his way and it made me fail a uh, test, which unfortunately, like if you fail one test, you get very close to failing the course. Um, so I was very much so in a, I could fail this class type of situation. And my friends that I had were just like, just study the way you normally study and you'll be fine on the next exam, which I did. Um, luckily I saved my butt with the final. <laughs> So I was able to continue on to third year, but it's definitely very difficult, very stressful at times. Yeah. So I know what was stuck with me when you were saying earlier was the, uh, the fact that you said that it was, it was more easier to be a human doctor than a animal doctor in this case. Um, <coughs> you said how many there were schools, veterinary schools, 33? 33. 33. nation? Mm-hmm. Now, do you think that there should be more? Obviously, no. Um, yes and no to an extent. Um, I would say yes, because then it would allow for more people like me in my case where I was waitlisted. Um, and I clearly think I do a pretty good job as a veterinarian. I think I'm a pretty good clinician. Um, a chance to, you know, show themselves and prove themselves that they deserve to be in this field excuse me, in this field. Um, at the same time though, whether or not there would be more veterinary schools, uh, it's more of an issue of supply versus demand. Um, we are very much so dwindling in numbers in veterinary medicine. Um, just like human medicine is dealing with a lot of short staffing, we are as well, um, not only because obviously of the pandemic, but also not a lot of people want to go into veterinary medicine because it's not, um, it's not a very uh, big field of reciprocity. You don't tend to get out of it sometimes what you put into it. Um, a lot of people think that we make an exorbitant amount of money. Um, we tend to make less than your average human GP, even on a good day. Um, we have a very high suicide rate. Our rate is about four times than the general public and about two times than it is in human medicine. Um, we very much so underpay our technicians who are our backbone and people don't think that our techs are just as necessary as like nurses, but that's essentially what they do. So a lot, a lot of people do it. It also has a lot of high debt to income ratio. Like I will be in debt, unfortunately, until the day that I die and then some, because I'm about uh, through undergraduate and graduate and medical school, I am a little bit under $500,000 in debt. Um, so it does, it's a lot of bigger weight. And so I think a lot of people realize it's not really a profession that 
gives back necessarily what you put into it. Most of us get into it because it's what we want to do and we don't really know how to do anything else, um, which is true. I don't know how I would do anything else with my life. I, I definitely love my job, but it can take a toll sometimes. So, okay. And so when you did that, you didn't have a plan B just in case anything happened? My plan B was medical school for people. Uh, if I didn't become a veterinarian, I was going to be a geriatric doctor. I like working with older people. I think oh. that they deserve a lot more uh, help in patients sometimes than they're given. So that was my backup if I didn't make it to be a vet. Yeah, um, I think now with with the medical field the way it is, I think that obviously as a nation, we should definitely review a little bit back more like what what this degree goes by and like the stress amount of stress and what we pay for it. I know that on a bottom dollar, most people are struggling to pay anything little, like little treatments. And that's where it becomes hard to like, I'm going to pay a thousand dollars to help my pet live. Like that's crazy. And they don't want to do that, but yeah. then they're so attached to their animal as well. So then it comes where like, I know that a lot of these places end up doing like those, um, surgeries are for free or uh, mm -hmm. pro bono and stuff like that so now you start losing money there mm -hmm. I know it's harder to do with humans because they, someone's always willing to pay for that at that point because it's a, it's a human's life mm -hmm. but they don't look at it the same way as with animals so it's an interesting field an interesting conversation to have yeah but yeah um it is something I run into I do discount a lot of stuff sometimes because a lot of people can't afford to pay um, which makes it difficult to treat animals because I can't, I can't do anything if I don't have the funds to do it. Um, and it hurts because there's dogs definitely where sometimes I know they need pain medications, or I know that if we just did x-rays, I could probably figure out what's wrong with their pet and they just can't afford to do that. Or sometimes they can't even afford the medications. Um, I'm fortunate to work at a place where we do payment plans. So people are able to at least say, I can't afford all of this at this point in time, but if you know, I can put down X amount of dollars, I can pay off the rest. So that definitely is pretty helpful, but also not a lot of places have it. I'm fortunate to work at a place that has it because we're part of a larger corporation, whereas small business animal hospitals that are like privately owned don't have that luxury because if nobody pays, you're not getting paid. You can't pay for your equipment. You can't pay for your tax. You can't pay for your own bills. Um, so it definitely does make treating animals a little bit more difficult when people are having financial constraints. Yeah, I guess, I mean, we, I think everybody loves animals, but when it comes to, I guess, you know, what Saul was saying, uh, when it comes to, I guess, saving the life of an animal, we, then when they tell us a certain amount, we're like, no, we think about it twice and it's like well i don't have the money you know we we let them go no um the thing that i also wanted to ask you was because i know we we three oh, well no right you weren't born in rhode island were, were you no i was raised in rhode island i was not born there man i was gonna ask something else but so but you you lived your whole life in rhode island no mostly, mostly yeah mm -hmm. Uh, and I know right now you're in Arizona. Um, how long do you have living there already in Arizona? Uh, with veterinary school, I am at about six years out here. And how was the process of adapting to Arizona, go going from Rhode Island? Um, that was a very interesting ordeal. Uh, my parents uh, fit everything that I could possibly fit into my little car, which I still have. Um, and it was me, my mom and my dad in a car and we drove cross country, um, to make it to Arizona because my parents couldn't take off enough time to help move me in. So we drove for about 13, 14 hours a day and we made it from Rhode Island to Arizona in about three days and then took the other two days to help me find, you know, a bed and, you know, a little kitchenette so I could sit and do it. Um, I lived in a studio for all four years of veterinary school because it was cheap, um, which was much needed with the amount of loans I was taking out. So it was definitely a very crazy process, um, especially even more so when you're called from the wait list. So 
you have to be, well, not necessarily have to be in a certain place, but you have to accept by a certain time frame. and classes start at the end of August. So I was called in April, mid-April, and I had to figure out my whole life in about three months and get everything out there and move out there and get everything set up, find an apartment um, that was within driving distance of school. Uh, we actually drove my car so that I would have a car to be able to get to school um, and basically figure all of that out within a time frame of like five days so that I would have enough time to get settled in before I started classes. So it was definitely a very much speedy and just kind of get it done process. I don't think I blinked really in that whole time frame. We just kind of got there. So it's definitely a little crazy. Yeah, always on the run, no? You didn't even yeah. get time to think about really what was going on. You were just like... Mm -hmm. And one of one of my really good classmates, she works back in California. Um, she was on the wait list and they called her for a seat in our class two days before classes started. So she had to move from California, Arizona within a day and find an apartment and everything like last minute because she had to be there by the time classes started, which was insane that they will they will continue to accept you up until the day before classes start. Now, the reason why I asked because your problem, your family's not there with you, right? Your family's all, all of it mm -hmm. is in Rhode Island. Mm -hmm. Do you miss Rhode Island and your family? Um, I miss my family. Definitely. It's very weird sometimes to not, uh, be around for like Sunday dinners and stuff. Um, but I, I like my life out here. I definitely got used to it and I like living out here. There's always something to do. I like that I can drive up north two hours and it's basically like being back in New England. They have the seasons change, they have snow. Um, I would like to hike, so it's a really good thing. Obviously I miss out on a lot of um, big lifestyle stuff with my family because I'm not back home, but I'm still kept in the loop. So it's really not that big of an ordeal, but it definitely sucks sometimes, but I like living my life out here. Especially the weather. No, we were just talking about yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, what sixty-eight degrees? Well, so I was dying over there, like minus eight almost. Here. It's great. <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't hate it, but I don't love it. So I'm in the middle of it right now. I mean, I it's brutal. all day this morning. It's brutal in the summers here, so I'll give that you that. True. Yeah, but you guys can, you know, you guys can be inside at the AC and then go out at night where it's nice and cool, and regardless of it. So mm, not necessarily cool, cool like. It could be like 10 o'clock at night during the, the summer months and it's like 88 degrees. So it's really not that cool. <laughs> That's more than fine. <laughs> well, I think Arizona and Texas have like almost the same temperature, no? As in uh, seasons. No, yeah. The only good thing is we don't have humidity here. So it doesn't it makes yeah. it a little bit more bearable than Texas. Yeah. yeah. But I mean, the cold is nice. The snow is nice, but maybe for like a day or two and. After that, it's like, nope. Yeah. Um, Saul? No. Uh, well, to continue with this, basically, um, I know that transition is a little bit hard, and I know that this is a difficult, this is a difficult profession to go into, but besides those people that, that, like, what would you say to those people that are, like, thinking about going into this field, like, does it really have to be something you love? Does it really have to be something you're going to dedicate your time to? Um, what do you What do you say to those people that are really just looking into it and be like, "Oh, I possibly want to be a veterinarian." I know that you're saying it's debt, like, but what are the good sides to it? What do you see now in the I, hospital setting you're in? I mean, I would tell them to think about it and then think about it again and then <laughs> think about it a third time. <laughs> um before they decide to go forward um I think that it's definitely something where you have to really love what you do and love this field to go through all of that because it's not easy at all in any way shape or form I mean I think it's general for life in general you know nothing that's great comes easy it takes a lot of hard work um but I will say the brighter side to it is I get to do what I love day in and day out um, I get to, I'm a very busy person. I don't know what to do if I have time to relax, to be perfectly honest with you. Not that veterinary medicine employs people that like to relax. Um, but, 
I get to do surgeries throughout the middle of my day in between seeing rooms. Um, sometimes I actually get to save pets' lives, which makes it a little bit worth it. Um, I don't know, just the fact that I'm actually doing what I wanted to do with my life technically tends to be the, the brighter side of things. And um, obviously I don't make an exorbitant amount of money, but I do make enough money to live comfortably, which is nice. Um, like, I think I'm very, very much so privileged and blessed to say that I can afford to pay loans and I can afford to know that I don't have to worry about where my next meal comes from. I can buy a gallon of milk without knowing the price, um, which is something not a lot of people get a chance to do in their lives. Um, but I would definitely say, given the amount of debt, given the amount of work, given the amount of effort, um, if it's something you really want to do, you definitely need to think about it and process it and understand all of these extra things that you're going to have to be okay with um, before you get into the profession. A lot of us, pretty much all of us get into it because we love animals and we love to be able to treat animals. Um, and it's just something that, you know, most of us cannot envision not working in this field, or at least, yeah. you know, I would like to not work every almost every single day or all the hours that I work, but I don't know that I would ever be able to like retire. Um, it's just too much of a, I guess, somewhat fun career to be a part of. Some days are great, some days are not. But overall, I think I, I pretty much love what I do on a daily basis. That's good. Uh, another question I have, well, like I know that we had a little bit of a side conversation about this, but. Obviously, you don't have to give a number. I just want to kind of like throw rough a rough percentage. But what was the difference of you being a, a doctor here, a veterinarian here, compared to Arizona? Like, I know that we were having this conversation on how much the price difference um, was for your salary or what you got paid. So I, I want to just throw off, like, what was the difference? Um, for my starting, well, so in veterinary medicine, there's salary base, and then there's what's known as pro cell, where you get a uh, production on top of your salary. So similar to any place that works with commission is essentially what it's like, where you get a base line, and then whatever you make above it, you make a certain percentage. Um, the salary base alone, comparatively between Rhode Island, Massachusetts, I applied as well for a couple of places. Um, and here was at least a 20 to, th to $30,000 difference. I made that much more here to start off with than I did um, in New England, which made it a little bit easier to pick a job. But Yeah. Uh, yeah. The reason I say that too is because that's just so interesting. Like the, I want to say cost of living may be sometimes uh, crazier up here, but yet they're willing to pay less. Um, and like you're saying, you're able to afford all these things and able to, you know, be blessed with that. But that's an awesome thing to think about. And I think that even for people in the career as well, like I know it's hard to think about moving or hard to think about, you know, uh, leaving people behind, but sometimes like those career changes, like it's so beneficial for you because you live a more quality life. You are more, uh, susceptible, you know, your doors open for a better compensation for all the work you do. So that's a good thing. And it's a good perspective to put out there. Mm -hmm. Now, do you think now going back to to what you said you no know, when Saul asked if uh you know when you said to for the people that wanted to get into vet school and be a, a a vet to think about it now do you think that there should be maybe more programs to help those people that want to get into that career to make it maybe easier economically to not have that debt or or what can be done to make it more easier for the people that want to get into uh that career if there's anything Honestly, I think it has just a lot to do with lobbying. I mean, just like anything, it's always politically motivated. Um, unfortunately for me, the school that I picked was very expensive comparatively to certain schools that allow for in-state tuition. Um, so like UC Davis, if you are a California resident, tuition for you as a veterinary medical student is about 32 to 35, I think, a year. Um, my tuition was about 62000 a year, and they don't allow for any difference of like if you're an Arizona resident or not. Um, on the other hand of things, though, my school was one of the first schools that kind of changed the way that they approach curriculum. 
So Midwestern University is all about day one ready and they kind of preach that and, and drill that into you and teach you like that from the start. So um, for example, most other veterinary schools, you don't get a chance to actually do any physical surgeries until you're in your fourth year, which is you're in your clinical rotation year. Um, and they basically just have you do spays and neuters um, before you graduate. So you at least know how to do that before you graduate. What Midwestern does is in your second year, so not only are you taking the difficult classes, you get a whole year of an actual surgery course where they teach you how to actually do spays and neuters under the provisions of different doctors as well as um, board certified surgeons. So throughout your second year, you're learning how to do surgeries already so that by the time you enter clinics and you have more involved cases, you already know your basics and can apply it more. So in my school, um, before COVID hit, which was changed things for the people below me. Um, I graduated veterinary school with about 56 surgeries under my belt, which is a lot more than people from other schools get. Um, and that included spays, neuters, um, rabbit spays, rabbit neuters, mass removals, leg amputations, um, dentals. Um, I think I took out one spleen while I was in school, but obviously with the help of a more um, certified surgeon, whereas other schools that are very laid back, you do all your coursework from your first year to your third year, and then your fourth year, which is all clinics where you put into um, practice essentially what you're learning and how you're basically like a little baby doctor under the head of an actual doctor who just checks everything that you're doing to make sure you're doing it correctly. During that year is when most people in veterinary school actually learn how to do surgery. So I definitely felt day one ready when I graduated. Like I had no problem when I started being able to do spays, neuters, dental, see patients because that's how they trained us. So yes, it was worth a lot of money, but it definitely prepared me a little bit better to go straight into practice. Um, it definitely also helps for people that don't wanna do an internship. So like I didn't wanna do an internship. Um, Whereas like if you're gonna go into a, um, to be a board certified whatever, whether that be a surgeon, cardiologist, internal medicine specialist, you have to do an internship, then a residency, and then you sit down for boards again and you get your certification as you know, you're board certified, et cetera. So I didn't wanna do an internship because I didn't want to be board certified in anything. So it definitely helped me feel a little bit more prepared to just go straight into practice. Um, with the way that my school taught me, which is different from other schools. So yes, it was a lot more money, um, but I think I got a lot more out of it. I think most of it though, what that has to do with schooling is just essentially the way the state wants to set it up. Um, if you think about it, it's a hot commodity in a sense of like, again, there's not that many schools. So obviously tuition is gonna be more money. So that way the people that want to do it, um, you know, it's exclusive. In that sense. Um, I think though that um, it should be made more accessible, um, especially because there's not that many people of color in this profession. Um, and I think that the only reason I was able to go to veterinary school was because I was able to afford to take out loans. I know that sounds weird to say, but not a lot of people can afford to take out loans. Um, never mind afford to take out loans to the extent that I have had to take out loans. Um, and so I think definitely making it a little bit more accessible would be easier for people that want to get into that profession to be able to go forward with that sentiment and do what they want to do with their lives. Yeah. Now, okay. So once you got you said you graduated with 56, um, what was that number? 56, right? 56 mm -hmm. uh, surgeries, Surgeries, right? Mm -hmm. So when you got your first patient, you weren't nervous anymore. Um, I wouldn't say I wasn't nervous. I was definitely more confident in myself. Okay. Um, but I was nervous because I'm actually now working on, excuse me, I'm actually now working on pets that people own that are going home with those owners at night who are actually paying me to do this. So it was definitely, yes. Um, you actually, obviously you have a lot more responsibility when you're in clinics, but you're still very much so like, I'm not the doctor yet. So I can kind of shove off some of that responsibility. And then once you're out in practice, it's like, you are the doctor, you are the person 
making that decision about this patient and you are the person that ultimately has to do X, Y, Z and, you know, explain to the owners why they're paying this amount of money for you to do it. So I wasn't necessarily nervous about performing those duties. It was just more the responsibility of them. Uh, I'm going to ask you this in a, I guess, in a funny way, what's more complicated, treating the animal or treating with the, with the client? Um, sometimes it's a little bit of treating the client. Um, definitely, I feel like a lot of jobs would sometimes be made a lot easier if the client wasn't involved, but obviously pets can't speak <laughs> for themselves. So it is still a little bit of, you know, you have to feel out the client and what they want, what they don't want, um, you know, whatever they're going to say or not going to say, or, um, and I mean, the only thing that you can do is basically give your recommendations and give your best medical advice. And ultimately they're going to decide what they want to do. Now, do you remember your first patient? Out in practice? Honestly, no. <laughs> I really don't remember who my first patient was out in practice. Oh, you're on mute. Yeah, I know. Sorry. Sorry. So what, which one's the most memorable one so far? I know that you said you've already been able to operate that on, on pets and stuff like that. So which one's the most memorable that you saw from start to finish? That I saw from start to finish? Um, oh, so I had a patient. She was technically, I didn't start off with her, but I did most of her treatments. Um, her name was Fiona. She was a very cute bulldog. I'm also very biased. I love my smush face breeds. Um, so I really like bulldogs. Um, and she had been uh, brought to us as kind of like a referral from emergency. So she had a couple of surgeries at emergency where she was an older girl. I think she was about nine. Um, she had what's known as a GDV or gastric dilatation volvulus, which is essentially your stomach fills up with air and then it flips over on itself. And so you can die from it. And so you have to surgically go in and unflip it. Um, and so she went to surgery at that um, emergency hospital to have that done. And they found a mammary mass. Um, and in dogs that are, whether they're spayed or not spayed, um, there's always a risk for mammary cancer. And so it's a 50-50 chance, whether it's cancerous or not. So she was referred to us to follow up with after the surgery and also discuss potentially taking off that mess. Um, my, one of my coworkers, one of the other doctors I work with had her first and they did find unfortunately cancer in her chest, but the owners wanted to go forward and surgically remove that mass from her chest area, um, from her mammary gland and just kind of see how she does. Um, basically if there's cancer in the chest, that's not really good news. Cause that means it's spread. Um, and it also makes it very, very high risk going under anesthesia for, um, essentially it makes her high risk for dying under anesthesia. Um, but she pulled through and she did great, but unfortunately the incision where we removed the cancer opened up. And so she had this giant, large gaping hole, essentially looking into almost her belly area um, underneath the skin. And that's when I took it over from a surgery perspective to try to suture it back up and take care of it. And I essentially dealt with this wound for, I think once a week for two months, I saw her every single day to try to get this wound and slowly and slowly and slowly it kept, you know, healing up on itself and getting smaller. Um, and then unfortunately, by the time we got it to the size of a quarter, which was, it went from like this big to the size of a quarter, which was like, yes, we're getting it finished. Like she's going to be healed. I don't have to see her again for quite some time. Um, unfortunately, the cancer spread to her brain and she started having seizures that we couldn't control. Um, she started having breathing difficulties we couldn't control um, as well as she started um, essentially like almost like not being able to be her normal self. So she had a lot of behavioral changes that were just very much unlike her. Um, and unfortunately um, she got to a point where the owners just decided her quality of life was no longer worth keeping her around despite all of the money and effort that they put into her. And I saw her through her euthanasia. So that was very sad. 
Um, but those owners were the most, I've never had any set of owners be that uh, gung-ho and that patient and that just like, keep doing it. Like money's not a problem, just keep going forward. Like they knew the cancer was already spread in the chest and they still were just like, nope, keep going, keep doing it. Like, we're just gonna keep pushing forward. She's doing great, et cetera. Like, even when we had certain setbacks, even when, you know, you try to put into perspective for them from a medical standing that like, she's eventually gonna die from this. It's eventually gonna spread before we can do anything about it. It's already spread and we can't really do anything about it. Um, they still just, because they loved her that much, kept going and, I euthanized it, which was pretty emotional because I had been treating her pretty much once a week for a whole two months, two and a half months. Um, and they were literally the nicest owners I've ever had. They loved me every step of the way. Honestly, I don't know if I've ever had any better clients than they are. And it saddens me because I know they won't get another dog that I can treat. Uh, but uh, that was kind of one of my first very long-term chronic um, dealing cases that I had while I was out in my first year of practice. Um, and it helped cause I didn't know if they had a lot of trust in me, um, because I was like, I'm still only a baby doctor. I've only been out here for like, you know, six, seven months. I don't know if you should trust me with your dog to that extent. Um, very much imposter syndrome, but, uh, she did great for what we could get her to. And unfortunately she decided she couldn't deal with it anymore and she went peacefully, but best and worst case I've ever treated. So, okay. So that has been your most complicated one so far. So far. Yeah. So far. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now when you went, when you went to vet school, so I'm assuming this also, you got to see a little bit how important is the, the nutritional uh, part for the animals as well. Can you repeat the question? Sorry. You cut out on my end. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you cut out a little bit. Sorry. Yeah, that when you went to vet school, I'm assuming that you also got thought a little bit on the nutritional aspect. How important is that also for the uh, animals to um, stay healthy, obviously? Nutrition's <laughs> pretty important. Um, we as a school weren't um, sponsored by certain brands. So certain veterinary schools are sponsored by big brands. So like if you go to a school that's sponsored by Hills, your nutrition course is going to be all about Hills science diet. If you go to a school that's sponsored by Royal Canin, you get taught about Royal Canin. So we weren't a school that was ever sponsored. Um, and our nutrition course just mainly focused on the actual nutrition side of things, um, which was pretty cool. Very short lived, but very cool. Um, it is pretty important. Um, a lot of additional issues or diseases that your pet can have can come from being um, not in a good body condition, um, which essentially is, you know, if we're giving a lot of treats or a lot of table scraps, that can lead to a lot of issues down the line. Um, if we're feeding for the weight that we are, then obviously we're going to continue gaining weight. We're not going to lose it. We need to be feeding for the weight that they should be, um, which can vary from dog to dog. Um, for me, it's essentially just the main things are making sure it's meant for that life stage. You know, if it's a puppy, feed puppy food. If it's an adult dog, feed adult food. If it's a senior dog, feed senior food. Um, and then obviously not grain-free diets. Um, grain-free diets have been shown to cause heart disease in dogs that would never have actually had heart disease. Um, and so making sure you stay away from boutique or um, limited ingredient diets are essentially what we push for, um, just so that way we don't have to deal with secondary heart disease just from a food that you fed your dog because you thought it was going to be this much better or the, you know, the marketing on it showed that it was going to be better in that sense. Um, ultimately for me, I don't care what you feed your dog so long as they're going to eat it and it's not grain free. Um, that's my belief on it. Other doctors have much different beliefs on it. So it just depends on who you ask essentially, but grain free is the main take on point. Don't How about, um, cause I, I know, and I've seen, uh, some owners of any animal giving them food that, that we eat. So, mm -hmm. uh, does that matter or? Um, yes and no. So the reason a lot of veterinarians don't push for table scraps is one, obviously it can cause weight gain because you don't know how many calories you're giving your dog. Um, but two, it can cause pancreatitis, which is inflammation of the pancreas. Uh, and that can lead them to have vomiting, diarrhea, be lethargic, um, have bloody stool, um, just really not want to eat for quite a few days. 
And also once you've had pancreatitis once, it makes it that much easier for the dog or the cat to get pancreatitis again and get it worse the second time. If you get pancreatitis enough, the pancreas will change itself and you can also get secondary diabetes from chronic pancreatitis because the pancreas is no longer working to do what it can do because it's only dealing with that inflammation. Now, I got uh, in one of the comments that I'm seeing right now. Uh, so, so actually, it's a personal one that we have a two year old kitten and she's like super big. So the question would be, how do you get her to be on a diet to lose weight? Because I think she weighs like 10, 15 pounds. And it's a kitten? Two years old. So once they're over a year old, they're no longer a kitten. They're an actual adult cat. Um, so main things with cats are essentially feeding for the weight that we should be. Um, although cats are known for being notorious for hunger strikes. So if they don't want to eat the food, they just will not do it. They're stubborn. Um, <laughs> so I wouldn't do it cold turkey. I would definitely say, you know, if we're feeding for the 10 to 15 pound weight, um, try decreasing it to, you know, the 10 pound weight and try to feed for that smaller size before we kind of do it cold turkey or um, free feeding your pets is the most common way to have your pet be out of body condition um, or get overweight. So it's really good to be regimented that you're using an actual measuring cup to measure out how much food you're giving. Um, and it's a lot easier with your own um, regimen as well as their own regimen um, to feed them either twice a day or if you're going to feed them all day and leave the food out all day, I'm guilty of it. I do it with my cat, um, making sure that you're actually measuring out exactly what you need to give for that entire day. And whether they're hungry or not is not my concern is I've given them the food that they're supposed to eat that day and that's their food period. Um, not that you can't give your pet snacks, but uh, you need to take it into account with their calories. So if you're gonna give them a lot of extra milk bones, a lot of extra friskies, treats or things like that, um, that we're taking into account, those are additional calories that we're putting into their day and we need to cut back somewhere. Um, believe it or not, milk bones, the little milk bones that we feed our dogs sometimes as treats, they have about the same caloric amount as a Big Mac. So if you're feeding your dog two or three milk bones a day, that's definitely going to add up on top of the food you're already giving them. So keeping that in mind, or at least transitioning over to healthy snacks. So cucumbers are great. They're water. They don't have a lot of calories in it. They'll keep them full. Um, apples without the core or the seeds, um, watermelon without the seeds or the rind. Um, green beans are great. They have a uh, little flavor and you can boil them and make them nice and soft or you can just feed them nice and crisp. Um, carrots are good to an extent. They just have a lot of sugar. So I wouldn't feed it every day, but it's also a healthier snack here and there than you would be giving a milk bowl. Very interesting. Mm -hmm. Very good advice. Yeah. Well, I mean, I know that we, like, at least for us, like we're always trying to just feed a dog whatever it wants because you want to just spoil them so it's it's a bad thing to do a bad habit i'm guilty um, of it i spoil my cat he gets in tuna sometimes yeah and, and, and it gets more to <laughs> like an emotional aspect too because you're eating and your, your, your cat or your dog gets there with you and it's like hey um where's my food you know mm -hmm. and it's like you feel better because you're eating and they're not eating it's like okay here you go you gotta be strict you gotta put the foot down and be like your food's over there that's where your food is yeah, that's what I do. So I like I technically don't have the food anywhere near like the the kitchen. So they don't like kind of come near us. They kind of have their own section, whether mm -hmm. it's a part of the house or whatever it is. And we're like, yep, you you can go over there. D don't even come here. Don't bother. Mm -hmm. Or sometimes when we're eating, I push them away from the table. I'm like, nope, go mm -hmm. go sit across the room because now they're not expecting anything. They're just waiting for you to finish, and then they yep. know they can go to their food or go wherever mm -hmm. they're gonna go with you. Yeah. Yeah. experiences of having dogs <laughs> yeah uh, so i know you said that you're a small animal and exotics uh general practitioner so mm -hmm. which what has been the most i guess exotic animal that you have uh treated so far um out in actual practice um the, the most recent one i guess i've dealt with was a snake I like snakes for use and work with. Um, in my entire like veterinary schooling and all of that, um, I did an externship at the zoo here because I like exotic animals and I also like <laughs> medicine. Um, 
I worked with a, a tamandua. So a tamandua is similar to an anteater. It's just in a different class. Um, and I worked with that. I got to spay and neuter a um, gray wolf at the, um, at the zoo. Um, I'm not great with large animals, but I tried my best to, to do hoofing of a, a, a zebu, which is like a type of uh, exotic uh, bull, essentially, that we have at the zoo. But I don't do large animals, so I'm not the greatest with, with that sort of ordeal. Um, and then I also got to treat a giraffe for its arthritis for quite some time. Um, giraffes are notorious for arthritis. Um, it makes it very difficult for them to treat. They also do not do well under anesthesia. So if they need any surgical procedures, it's very, very, very big ordeal. Um, and you also have to take their quality of life into consideration because there is a very high probability they can die under anesthesia. So it makes it difficult to treat them. But um, I didn't practice snake uh, in How my entirety it? of things, <laughs> other stuff. How is it to treat a snake? Um. Sometimes it can be a little bit difficult. Um, I personally like snakes. I like to, they're pretty easy for handling if they know how to be handled. Um, I don't do venomous because I don't have venomous experience. I don't have venomous certification. I just do your regular, like your boas in the household or milk snakes, things like that. Um, but uh, their body cavities, you know, you can separate it into thirds to know where things are. Um, x-rays are really fun. So um, a simple way to take an x-ray is you put them in a very long slender tube um, and close off both ends and you can just kind of rotate the tube to get the shots that you need. Um, so that's fun to take x-rays in that way. Um, surgery is a bit difficult. I don't have a lot of experience with surgery and exotics, so I don't tend to do surgery on exotic animals all that often until I get more experience. So that is the long-term plan for that on exotics, but um, mass removals can be difficult because you, when you suture it together, you have to make sure the scales line up. If the scales don't line up, you can lead to dermatitis or other skin issues long-term, um, or the inflammation can actually make its own separate mass. So when you're suturing it together, you have to make sure that you're taking into account the scales and making sure that they're lining up properly. But I do like to work with snakes, it's a lot of fun. I don't get them very many often, but I like to work with them. Now, this is where I'm going with this because I know the snakes could be kind of scary, you know, for some people. But I know if I would <laughs> see a snake, I would be like, I don't know, rather stay away from it. But now, uh, is there any animal that you're kind of like, not scared, but like a little bit, you're like nervous maybe to treat or anything like that? Um, I don't do hedgehogs and I don't do sugar gliders. Um, I also don't treat invertebrates, so I'm very, very terrified of uh, spiders. I don't, I can't do spiders. Um, I've tried at the zoo one time to work on a tarantula because we needed to do a tarantula. And I had to tell my boss that I was like, I just, I can't do it. Like, I can't bring myself to like get near it and touch it and whatever. And she made me hold it because she was like, you're going to get over your fear. And she made me hold it. And I was like, trembling the entire time and then it moved and I freaked out and I almost dropped the, the spider so I don't I don't do spiders not my forte I will not they're cool to look at in their enclosure I will not work with them can't do it won't do it <laughs> yeah that's very very interesting so, that came from the movie that the, the, the fear that spider fear <laughs> I don't, I don't do spiders. They're also very smart to an extent. So sometimes they kind of figure out your tricks, which makes it a little bit more difficult. But again, I just can't do the hairy legs and stuff. I love people who love them. Like, that's cool. Applaud you for having spiders. I, I can't work with them. Yeah, I think that the snakes and the, the spiders come in hand in hand with like they're, they're definitely something that people get scared of. And I think that's the biggest fears people have um, because it's tangible and sometimes they're in your house or they've seen stuff like that as well and uh, i think the movies don't make it any better right like you're saying no. the movies and like anaconda and then the other spider movie were like the, the I, I wish people would get over their fear of snakes because like they're honestly some of the best pets to have sometimes um they're just they're very smart um they love to cuddle most of them love to cuddle like if you have a little sweatshirt pocket and you just show them in your little sweatshirt pocket man they love it they'll just sit in there all day 
and just like chill all day with you. Some of them can get feisty. I'm not going to lie. Some of them can get a little attitude-y, um, but I love working with them. Although I'm not allowed to work with snakes if my boss is in the building. She is deathly afraid of snakes. And if I have an exotic and it's a snake, she will literally leave the hospital and will not come back until that snake has left. So I don't get to work with them that often. But oh, man. <laughs> Uh, That's interesting. So is there any animal that you that you haven't worked with that has a chance to treat that you look forward to uh, treating at one point, maybe in the near future? Um, not really. Um, I guess mainly my thing is like I haven't gotten to treat a lot of surgical things because I don't have a lot of surgical experience. I guess the goal is to, you know, maybe in five years or so be able to actually perform surgeries. Like um, I can only do spays and neuters on rabbits. That's the extent of my surgical habits with exotics. Um, like I want to be able to spay a guinea pig and neuter a guinea pig. Um, I've neutered rats. They're not that difficult to neuter. Um, I've never spayed a rat before though. So that would be cool to learn. Um, tortoises are really good fun to try to work with. Although treating them is a very chronic long end game plan type of ordeal um, where we don't usually have a lot of the uh, injectable medications that I need. So I usually have to refer them elsewhere for their care. So hopefully getting able to be established to a point where I actually can follow through on the care on most of my exotics. Now, uh, what are your goals in the future? Um, Couldn't really private, tell you. private practice, continue in this hospital setting field, um, anything in that area? In veterinary medicine. Um, I will eventually move into private practice. Um, private practice is great. I think you make a lot better clients in that sense of private practice because you're pretty much always going to see those same people. Um, I think long-term would be once I get close to like a retiring age, which most of us never retire, but once I get close to a retiring age, uh, move to a desk job, it would be nice to have normal hours for once. Um, that's the, that may change as time goes on. Which now that you say about the hours, you pretty much don't have, well, you're pretty much working all day, mostly, right? And pretty mm -hmm. much all, uh, all seven days. Uh, where I work, we're open seven days a week. Um, our, uh, we actually just got decreased how many days a week we're supposed to work. Um, I used to have to work nine days out of a 14 day period. Um, they've now reduced us to four days per week, which is very nice. It helps a lot with my work-life balance. However, I'm never out on time. It's a very big rarity if I'm out on time. Um, so essentially I'm always there maybe an hour, two hours after my shift is supposed to have ended. Cause I have to finish up calling people about blood work and reviewing x-rays and calling them about that. Um, finishing up my records, making sure all my records are finished for the next day. Um, making sure every script that needed to be approved has been approved or denied however it needs to be. Um, so sometimes it is a lot of additional work after hours that, um, keeps me there for quite some time, which isn't the case for everybody. Um, you know, I definitely like, I give all the power and blessings to people that work emergency medicine. I cannot do that day in and day out, man. Like they work 13, 14 hour, 15 hour shifts sometimes still have to do their records and go home and you know, all of that good stuff. And they're the ones that deal with just emergencies on a daily basis. I deal with them as they come in here and there, but I don't do it every single day, every single hour, you know, for my life, that's not my career. I'm a general practitioner for that reason. Um, but I definitely uh, give it to them. They tend to have more longer hours than I do, but I usually average in about 10 to 11 hours, sometimes 12 on a, on a normal basis. Yeah. That's yeah, long day. I mean, and are you on call? Like when you get home and you, you get called sometimes and you go in or no, luckily I'm not. Um, if you work emergency medicine, definitely there are always uh, rotating weekends that you're on call. Um, essentially, again, if somebody needs extra help or um, you have patients left in hospital, um, there are certain places that you will have on call. So we are uh, general practice only. There is nobody there after hours at night. 
Um, so we don't have to do anything about on call. Um, however, I do have friends that work in, they are general practitioner, they're still private practice, but if they have emergencies, they have the capability and the technicians to have overnight. And so if that is your case, you are on call should anything happen with that specific patient. But where I work, I don't have to be on call, luckily. Just but unfortunately, yeah. we see emergencies during the day. We kind of never really turn anything away. So I'm always there all the time for a lot of hours. Yeah, yeah it's crazy. I mean, but I mean, like, like everybody says, no, if once you love what you're doing, it doesn't really, it's not really a job, no. I mean, sometimes it can be a job, but for the most part, I like what I'm doing. I definitely don't like the paperwork aspect of it, but I do like what I'm doing. I think nobody, nobody likes that paperwork aspect, yeah. all those paper <laughs> filling and all that good stuff, you know, like everything else of like the actual work work, like anybody can do. But I think that when it comes to the responsibilities and the, the rest of the stuff is just like, eh, I wish I could leave it for like, tomorrow or somebody oh, yeah. else can do it for me. So I wish, I wish that would be great. <laughs> Now, now that you're you're practicing and everything, and after all the stuff that you went through, and now that you look back, has it has it been worth it? Um, I mean, that's a long sure, wait. That's I'm a long sure, wait. <laughs> yeah, no, and I'm pretty sure, like you said, you no, know, you have goals and to and to go into the. the to get better and to get more experience and to grow more. Right. Mm -hmm. And I'm pretty sure you'll get there. Uh, but right now, that's how you look back. Ha has it been worth it so far? Um, for the most part, I, but I definitely would not repeat it. <laughs> that was a lot of schooling, a lot of hard days, hard nights, basically just eat, sleep, breathe veterinary school on a regular basis. So I definitely wouldn't redo it, but um, seeing where I'm at in my life, I definitely think that uh, I made it where I'm supposed to be. And I mean, nine, nine times out of 10, I'm loving what I do. Obviously there's always that small bit that we're always just like, ugh, I wish I was not a vet at this point in time. But for the most part, I I don't think I could do it differently, but I definitely wouldn't do it again, to put it lightly. Now, uh, is animals your only passion or is there anything else that you uh, like as much? Um, like if I had to choose a different career? A different career or maybe it could be something personal that you, that you like. Uh, I definitely like marine biology. At one point when I was in college, I was going to switch to be a marine biologist. Um, but then ultimately I was like, hmm, I should stick to going to veterinary school. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I do like, like I love whales. I definitely think whales are very, very interesting. I got to do whale behavior for a very short period of time while I was in college and I loved every second of it. Um they're just, they're so incredibly, incredibly smart and the way they figure out how to navigate their lives and take care of their young and do everything, communicate, so everything is just like, they're incredible. They're incredible, incredible creatures. Um, if I ever had to change careers, I would definitely be like a whale marine biologist because I, I love it, but um, I definitely like where I am currently. <laughs> Now, do you, this is a more, a more kind of personal question. Do you plan on, on practicing and staying there in Arizona or maybe going to Rhode Island or maybe going somewhere else? Or are you open to that? Um, as of right now, the plan is to stay here. I like my life out here. Um, my money goes a lot farther out here than it does back in New England. So it's always a difficult sell to try to envision going back to new england so for right now yes i i plan on staying out here in arizona yeah, weather's go. great for nine months out of the year so I <laughs> it. Don't, don't remind so <laughs> i know you have me hating my life over here right now sorry it's all good <laughs> yeah i mean i think we're in the same boat no i mean if it was for us because we have mostly all our family in rhode island well we would want we would want to love being there but it's like once you're over here and you see the opportunities that you got it's like 
you. It's like right now your your life is here, no? Where you're mm-hmm. at. And yeah. Maybe in the future, who knows, no? Yeah, things change. So as of right now, that's the plan, but we'll see what happens, you know, 10 years down the line, five years down the line. Yeah. So? Yeah, no. Um, don't have much more. I mean, it's great to hear from your life. Uh, great to hear from like that Dr. Gwen uh, side of everything. I know it's kind of weird to say that since I've known you for <laughs> so long. So, weird. I but, don't even uh, hear it. Yeah. I mean, like I said, uh, you've earned your degree. You've done your work. I think that as you're saying, like all this debt that like, you acquire and like all, all your hard work, I think is uh, worth mentioning and it's worth calling you a doctor at that point. So congratulations on your career so far. Thank you. I appreciate it. Now, I did have one more question. So I know I asked that this be- at the beginning, but I wanted to ask you, so what didn't let you give up? Um, friends and family. Absolutely. Um, my boyfriend was there with me all step of the way. Um, we actually uh, started going out right before I got accepted to veterinary school. And I, you know, told him I was like I'm gonna be living out in Arizona like if you want to try this we can definitely try this like but you know I'll be out there and he stood by me all four years he's still with me now he actually lives out here with me which is great um definitely a big support system my family was a big support system um my friends that I'm very close with just knowing that they were supporting and you know with me every step of the way, like there were times I wanted to quit and they'd be like, you know, if you quit, we'll still stand by you. But like, I don't think that you really actually want to give up. You've been wanting to do this your whole life. Um, Also, I guess from a first generation type of perspective here, it's a, a step for me is a step for everybody. Not that it doesn't add a lot of extra weight, but, um, making my parents and my grandparents see that their struggle was worth it essentially also like you know you whatever you went through you went through and I still was able to come out here and prove to you that I can make something of myself yeah that's I think that's the most important part and that's I think what we all have in common no we want to make and we want to break those barriers that that we can do and we can make them proud after all they they've done and struggled with um well, I guess to, to finish off, always at the at the end, I have like this dynamic of questions, super, like maybe fast questions. Mm-hmm. So just whatever comes to your mind. Um, so if you're ready, we'll start off with the first one that says, uh, I'm going to say them in Spanish. So I wrote some okay. in Spanish. So. Okay. Uh, ¿Qué significa Rhode Island para ti? Um... My family and authentic food, <laughs> 100%. Uh, there's one thing I miss being out here is there's not a lot of authentic food. Like in Rhode Island, you could be like, oh, I want authentic Vietnamese, Thai food, Cambodian food, and go to Upsara. You know, it's family owned. You can get whatever food you want. If you want Jamaican food, there's always some place you can get Jamaican food. If you Dominican want Guatemalan, food. Colombian, Dominican, like you can always find it out here. It's very, very scarce. Um, Mexican food is abundant, obviously. Um, but like I have still to find, I've only found one Guatemalan bakery my entire six years out here. Um, I have yet to find an authentic Cambodian place for food or Korean place for food. Um, so I definitely miss that. And then obviously all my family is back home. So I only get to see them whenever I get the chance to fly back home. So it definitely makes things a little bit difficult. Okay, and the second question would be, just finish off the sentence. Los animales son? Increíbles. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, that that makes sense. Uh, When was the last time you got mad? When I got mad? Yeah. Five minutes ago. (laughs) (laughs) like before this before, right before, before this started no. <laughs> yeah. um last time i got mad probably like very mad um thursday thursday, 
Thursday was a very difficult day. Uh, I had about three completely separate, uh, completely separate dogs, all completely separate dog fights, um, three critical, completely separate dog fight wounds back to back to back in the course of an hour. I was like the only doctor readily available. So that was, there was a lot of cussing going on, not around the odors <laughs> in that context. Uh, what do you prefer? Walk on the park or walk by the beach? Walk in the park. She's a hiker, so she definitely likes that. I do like, I do like to hike. Um, I like nature. Your favorite food? My favorite food? I don't think I have a favorite food. Or what is it that that you can go for every day? It doesn't matter. That you won't get tired of. Avocado toast. Um... <laughs> <laughs> That I could go every single day. That you don't get tired of. Fries. <laughs> I could what? always go for potato oh, fries. McDonald's or what? Just any fries anywhere. I'll always eat fries. I love fries. Uh, okay. Agua o café? Uh, water, because I don't drink coffee. I know I'm going to get a lot of hate for that one. I don't drink coffee. Your, your boy over here. <laughs> Two coffees mm -hmm. every day. I know he's ridiculous. He drinks so much coffee. That dude has more coffee than blood in his system. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> this uh, is this is a tea. You see, you're supposed to be drinking a tea. So. It's alright. I I also have water, so uh, me. <laughs> uh, wine or beer? Wine. I hate beer. If I had to choose, hard liquor, but. In this context, wine. What do you like of yourself? Of myself? It's a very existential question. <laughs> um, <laughs> what do I like about myself? Um, I like that I have a very strong work ethic. I think I have a pretty good work ethic and dedication. Um, I hold myself to a high demand when it comes to my profession and I hold myself to that standard. I try to hold everybody else to that standard. Be the best version of yourself you can be. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I, I, think, I think you're right on that. Um, favorite superhero? I don't have a favorite superhero. <laughs> I don't really watch, uh, I don't really watch a lot of superhero movies. Yeah, um, you you're letting all those all these fans down. <laughs> I'm sorry, everybody. Um, favorite superhero? Batman. I do like Batman. There you go. Um, I do also, I will say, I just actually, not very long ago, I had not seen any of them. So sorry, everybody, you're going to murder me for this. I just started watching all the Marvel movies. I had never watched any of the Marvel movies. I'm okay. With, I'm there with you um, because I haven't watched any of them, so it's all good. I had never, and I watched them um, in chronological order um, with my boyfriend, and I really like Iron Man. I will say that. He and out of all the movies, I like Iron Man. <laughs> okay, okay. Now, the last question would be, and I know we're, like, super young, but just, ¿Cómo te gustaría ser recordada? Um, that always throws everybody off. Yeah. yeah, I don't know. How would I like to be remembered? I, I mean, I don't really care to be remembered, to be Dang. honest with you. Um, but if I were going to be remembered for something, it'd be um, being passionate about what I do. I, I don't think I would, anybody at this point or in the future, I would hope would say that I didn't put my all into everything that I did with my career and how I'll help patients and things like that. So I guess in that regard, if I ever go out, go out being the best vet that I could be. Yeah. Yeah. That's, I think that's, that's a really good thing you want to be remembered as well. Gwen, I think it was a, a very good conversation. Uh, that's why, you know, that's why I wanted to invite you and have you on. Cause I know that you were going to bring a lot to, to the episode and, and give all that, all the uh, the people watching and hearing, you know, that information, that advice also, if they wanted to be a, a vet in the future or how to 
take care of their their pets so i i appreciate it was you fun being, being here uh, this was a fun time <laughs> <laughs> yeah no thank you dr gwen again once more i uh, appreciate it and so good weird. to see yeah good to see uh you know just more people or more of the younger generation you know coming up and becoming doctors becoming this right so like that's coming mm -hmm. into fruition um mm -hmm. it's good to know that there is uh, a friend that we can call up on and ask any questions you know so this is great um and then yeah hopefully we continue to have these conversations yeah this was a really fun time and hopefully i told a lot about you guys about the reality of the profession but um don't think that I'm cynical about it. I really love what I do. <laughs> <laughs> um, just last thing, just be nice to your vets. Be nice to your vet techs. We all do our best on a daily basis. I know this pandemic has put a wrench in everybody's plans and lives and, you know, everything. And it's difficult the way we navigate the pandemic. But just be nice to everybody. You never know what somebody's going through. And, you know, you never know your comment could be make or break somebody's day and I'd rather make somebody's day. So just be nice to your vets if you are going to go to your vet. Yeah, I think you're right in what you say. No, we, we got to be more nice towards each other. And even though we may be stressed or are not having our things our way, we maybe got to take a, a deep breath and think over things and try to be nice to everybody, especially after these two years now that have been tough for for maybe all of us now um well this was a good chat um yeah thank you again and uh, for everybody that was listening and watching thank you everybody and uh we would see you guys on thursday at seven it's gonna be also very a very good chat and uh thank you gwen and thank you saul and thank you we'll see we'll see everybody on thursday hasta luego